In his letter to the church in Colossae, Paul prays these words. May you be strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all patience and endurance, and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. These words were true for the Christians then, and they are also true for us today. And this is why we're still gathered here together online in this manner this evening, to remind ourselves of the hope of glory that we share and to proclaim this hope to anyone who might desire. Well, good evening and welcome to Beeston Free Online. Uh, if we've not met before, my name is Yong-En and I'm a trainee in this church. A particular warm welcome to you uh, if this is your first time joining us or maybe even your first experience of church. Uh, we're really glad to have you with us and we're going to be together for about 45 minutes uh, or so this evening, uh, you know, doing pretty much the same things that we would do on a normal Sunday service. So we will pray together in a moment. Uh, we'll hear God's word preached to us. Unfortunately, uh, we wouldn't be able to sing. Uh, but we do have a playlist of songs uh, that have been specifically uh, selected to help us reflect on the sermon later. Uh, so do listen in to them after the service. So just a few uh, quick notices as we start. So the first is that uh, the church prayer meeting is this Wednesday on Zoom uh, from 8 to 9 p.m. Ellie will be in touch uh, with the link at some point this week, so do look out for that. It'll be really nice uh, for us to you know, gather as a church and uh, to hear about local things, national and global things that we can pray about. Now, the second thing to say is that, well, today we were actually due to have our annual gathering uh, of all the FIEC churches in Nottingham. Uh, well, obviously we can't do that, so instead, each of the eight churches have recorded some news uh, and that's been compiled together. So if you're wondering what the, church, what the eight churches are, well, they are, I've got a list for you. So there's Esplee, there's Arnold Road, Cornerstone, Emmanuel Bramcook, uh, Redeemer Church, Stapleford Baptist, and of course, ourselves and the Rylands. So a video went live on YouTube at 6 p.m. Uh, this evening. So you should have had a link sent to you with the Psalms email over the weekend. So do tune into that uh, after this as well. And we'll be praying for the FIEC churches in, in the city at our prayer meeting this Wednesday. Finally, uh, so yes, the, the cap money course, uh, well, so Beeston Free will be running this course uh, sometime in early June. The course is, you know, it's, it's a simple, but it's also a highly effective money management course that you know, seeks to equip people with budgeting skills. So I've heard really good feedback on this one, and there are no requirements for this. So if you're interested, or if you know anyone who might appreciate you know, help in managing uh, their money better, uh, do uh, contact the church office, send in an email, and you can find the email address on our website. Oh, we are going to be spending some time praying together now. So yeah, why, why don't we bow our heads in prayer? Yeah, gracious Father, thank you that uh, you have delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. Thank you that we have Jesus, uh, the hope of glory dwelling in each of us. And thank you that you have qualified us to share in your holy inheritance. And to that end, we long, yes, we long for the day uh, when we will indeed see you face, face to face. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for uh, the gospel partnership that we share with the other churches in, in the FIEC. And in particular, we think of those in our city. Father, please would you uh, give our leaders wisdom as they seek to continue making you known in these times. And we pray for your sustenance and we pray for your grace uh, as they continue to shepherd your, sh your church and, and pour themselves sacrificially for them. We praise you and we thank you for the encouraging news of multiple gospel opportunities that have come about as a result of lockdown. And we pray that we as Christians would continue uh, to be bold in setting forth the hope of the gospel, and especially in these uncertain times. Yeah, please would you strengthen us uh, with all power according to your glorious might, that we might be people uh, who walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we were called. And finally, Father, we just want to pray for ourselves now. A place that you be speaking to us through your word. A uh, uh, place with the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. 
And please, with your word, transform us and help us to understand you better and to love you more. Because we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, in the last few, yeah, in the, in the last few weeks, you know, Dave has been taking us through uh, the book of Romans. Uh, we wouldn't be doing that tonight, uh, so apologies if you were expecting a bit of that. Uh, but, but instead, today, uh, as well as next Sunday, uh, I'll be leading us through a two-week series in John. Uh, in particular, we'll be looking at chapters 9 and 10. So 9 today and 10 next week. And Well, you know, John's Gospel is a, it's a really theologically rich book. And like, to be completely honest, you know, there were multiple times in, in the last week uh, that, I, that I really regretted choosing it just because I found it so hard to prepare. And there's so much going on in it. And so what I'm going to be saying tonight is just going to, you know, only begin to scratch the surface of the iceberg, the tip. Uh, but that being said, you know, I have been really encouraged by it. And so I do, I do pray uh, that you'll find the next two weeks helpful to you. Uh, so if you've got a, a Bible with you, uh, do turn with me now uh, to John chapter 9. It's a reading from John chapter 9. As he went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. For I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some, some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Well, how, were, how then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed, and then I could see. Well, where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes that he opened. And the man replied, he is a prophet. They still did not believe that he had been, bl been blind and had received his, his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know that he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes? We don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age. Ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples too? 
But then they heard insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man asked, Oh, sorry, the man answered. Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. Well, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Okay, if you've got your Bibles, do keep it open. Well, recently, you know, I saw, uh, I saw a video, and, I, and so I initially wanted to show it to you guys, but because of copyright issues, I can't do that. So what I'm going to do is to tell you, describe it to you instead. So in the video, uh, there's a little girl who attempts to complete various trick shots uh, while blindfolded. So for example, you know, she tries bouncing a ping pong ball off the wall and into a cup. So something like that. Oh. As you can see, obviously the ball fell way short of the cup. But then her dad, who's secretly, well, her dad who's filming it, secretly makes it look like she succeeded. He catches the ball, and then he places it in the cup before she turns around. And so when the daughter removes her blindfold, she sees the ball inside the cup, and she celebrates. Like, yes, I did it, you know. She innocently claims the credit because she was oblivious to what really happened. And well, when I, when I saw that, it, it made me smile. I'm sure many of you uh, would readily do the same for your kids. But what, what's the point of me uh, telling you this? Well, because I think uh, that the little girl's reaction is an accurate portrayal of how we often first view our salvation. You know, I chose to believe, or it was then that I gave my life to Christ. And while, while all those things are true, our passage today will show us a different perspective, uh, the, the perspective of the Father, and help us come to the realization that, you know, hey, it wasn't me. I wasn't able to believe. And I pray uh, that doing so will fill us with humility and gratefulness. So our passage begins with Jesus, you know, noticing the man. Uh, we're told that the man was born blind. And the disciples' reflex is to attribute this to sin. Verse 2, they ask, Rabbi, who sinned? Are this man or his parents that he was born blind? In other words, is this man suffering his punishment for a specific sin? To which Jesus replies, Neither this man sinned nor his parents, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. Now, it's probably worth pointing out a few things about what Jesus is saying and isn't saying here. Uh, so firstly, Jesus isn't denying that sin uh, is the reason suffering exists today. Like, it is. You know, Paul tells us in Romans 8 that the whole creation has been subjected to futility as a result of man's sin uh, in Genesis 3. But secondly, Jesus is also not saying that Suffering is never a direct consequence for sin. To be sure, suffering is sometimes uh, a direct consequence of sin. We think of the church in Corinth, uh, where Paul says that some believers were ill and weak and even died because they were misusing the Lord's Supper. 
But this is, not, this is usually not the norm. And so it would be presumptuous to always you know, draw these causal lines of uh, well, effect, you know, cause and effect. So what is Jesus saying here? Well, Jesus is saying that disabilities, or more generally, suffering in the present, is not always linked or not always owing to specific sins in the past. You see, right here, the explanation for the man's blindness isn't found in the cause, but in the purpose. And the purpose is so that the works of God might be displayed in him. You see, God ordained the man's blindness and suffering in order that we might see and marvel at his glory. Now, you know the, the pastoral implications of this are huge, and we, but we don't have the time to go into detail now. But for the Christian, this means that there is more to suffering than the pain we might feel at the moment. In, in, in Romans 8, Paul tells us that God is working all things for our good. So whatever the pain you might be experiencing, know that the causes of your pain aren't decisive in explaining it. You know, what is absolutely decisive is God's purposes in them. Now, I'm not belittling your suffering. I'm not saying it's easy. Like, it's really hard. And I know that. I get that. Like, this is something that I really relate to personally at the moment. Like, you know, anxiety has been my closest friend in the last year. But here, Jesus tells me, like, this isn't a punishment. Like, this isn't random. My anxiety is so that the works of God might be displayed in me. And if you're suffering, like, God has a good purpose for you too. Neither this man nor his parents sin. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in them. And so the purpose, so the purpose of, the mind, of the man's blindness is to make God's work visibly apparent. And so this naturally leads us to ask, well, what exactly is the work of God that Jesus is talking about here? And Jesus gives us two clues in verses 4 to 5. Uh, firstly, in verse 4, he says, we must do the works of him who sent me. So Jesus himself, Jesus is going to show us what God's work is. And then secondly, in verse 5, this work is related to Jesus being the light of the world. And so having told the disciples what to look out for, uh, Jesus then spits on the ground, he makes some mud with uh, saliva, and he annoys the man's eyes. Like he, and then he sends the man to wash in a pool. The man obeys, he goes, and he comes back seeing. Like, great, you know. Like maybe John wants, to, wants us to see uh, that the works of God is to restore the physically blind. Oh, except if that were true, then surely verses 8 to 41 would be redundant. I mean, surely the first seven verses already attest to this truth. Like, why do we need the rest of the passage? You see, there's something deeper going on here, and I think this will become clearer as we work our way through the rest of the passage. And so the thing, the thing with some of the signs in John's gospel uh, is that you, need, uh, you kind of need a, a macro, big-picture perspective uh, to see what really is happening. And so uh, that's what I'm going to try uh, to do in the rest of our time today. Uh, so it's going to be slightly different from what we usually do uh, in, in having like multiple points and application. But instead, I'm going to first take us through the whole narrative to help, to help us see uh, the point that John is trying to make uh, before seeing just how we can apply it to our lives. So yeah, do, do bear with me, bear with me as we work through this next section together. So yeah, what, what happens or what follows in verses 8 to 34 is pretty much, you know, what you get when you apply for a graduate job. Like, John records a, se a sequence, a series of interviews, and he's got background checks, and he's got personal testimonies to help us understand what Jesus' work is. And so as we work through these interviews together, I'd like you to look out for how the blind men and the Pharisees respond differently to Jesus. So the very first thing that John does uh, is to establish the man's credibility. So, you know, undeniably, uh, the giving of sight is something that only God can do. And so the question is, uh, you know, did Jesus really do it? Like, was the man really born blind? 
And so the blind man's neighbors are interviewed in verse 8. The neighbors are in disbelief, like they clearly recognize him as the man who used to sit and beg. But some of them are doubtful because they remember that he was blind. But the man insists, like, hey, no, I'm the same person that you knew. Well, how then were your eyes open? Verse 11, the man they call Jesus made mud and put it on my eyes. See, here, here we get a glimpse of the blind man's initial understanding. You see, at this point, uh, Jesus is simply just the man. Nothing special. But now that we've, so now that we've got personal testimonies, you know, it's time for some serious questioning. And so the man is brought to the Pharisees who ask him how he had received his sight. Well, you know, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. And that's amazing. But the Pharisees spot a problem, you see. According to their traditions, healing was prohibited on the Sabbath. See, in their eyes, uh, Jesus was a sinner who was guilty of breaking the Sabbath. And so they conclude in verse 16 that he cannot possibly be from God. And on, on the other hand, uh, you've got some of them who rightly recognize that a sinner couldn't possibly perform the signs that only God can do. And so they are divided at this point, and they, they, they look to the man and they ask him in verse 17, well, what do you say about him uh, since he has opened your eyes? And now the, the formerly blind man answers, he is a prophet. <laughs> he's no longer just an ordinary man. He's a prophet sent from God. He says, something is happening in this man's heart. And what about the Pharisees? Well, uh, verse 18, they refused to believe that Jesus had miraculously restored the man's sight. So what they, do they do? They bring in his parents for further background checks. And so verse 21, his parents reply, uh, yes, he is our son, and yes, he was born blind. But how he now sees, uh, we, we do not know, uh, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Why don't you ask him for yourself? Ask him how it is that he now sees. But then John gives us some really uh, important information in verse 22. You see, it wasn't, it wasn't that they didn't know, but rather they were afraid of acknowledging that Jesus had healed their son because the Pharisees had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue, cast out of his own community. You see, at this point, you know, the Pharisees had already made up their minds about Jesus. You know, despite the clear evidence, they are un unable to look past their man-made Sabbath prohibitions. You see, it never occurred to them that, you know, Jesus' healing on the Sabbath was a sign uh, that the promised future rest of the Messianic age was at hand. And finally, the man is brought for a second interview uh, with the Pharisees, so... Now, actually, it's more of a threat than an interview. Verse 24, they refuse to see and acknowledge Jesus for who he really is. And so they demand that the man gives glory to God by condemning Jesus as a sinner. Oh, see, see the irony in that, like, give glory to God, call his son a sinner. Okay, well, rather than yielding in fear, though, the man, the man makes a stunning confession. Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. See, the man sees even clearer now, and he refuses to join them in their blasphemy. So again, the Pharisees ask how he had received his sight, which honestly at this point is just ridiculous. Like, have you not been listening? Like, what more is there to say? See, the, the problem, that problem wasn't a lack of knowledge. It was a conscious rejection of knowledge. You see, the man sums it up really well for us in verse 27. Like, I told you, but you would not listen. And so in rather sarcastic fashion, he then invites them to become Jesus' disciples. And you, you can already guess what happens next. Well, they turn against the man and they insult him. And refusing to vouch, and the man resolutely declares in verse 33, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And that's the final straw. 
for his confession, he is thrown out of the synagogue. And this leads us uh, to our final conversation between Jesus and the man. So let me read verse 35 to 38 for you, for us again. Uh, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. But Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. You know, it's hard not to come out of this whole sequence. Uh, It's hard not to come out of it marveling at just how irrational and how blind the Pharisees were. But you know, what's equally amazing is how the man persistently sticks with Jesus and defends him, despite the risk of being thrown out of his own community. And so we see two very clear but different progressions. You know, as the chapter progresses, the blind man sees clearer and clearer. Whereas the Pharisees who think they're blind, well, who, sorry, the Pharisees who think they see actually see reality less and less clearly, eventually proving to be blind. You see, the man was born blind, and then he sees Jesus as a man. And then he sees Jesus as a prophet. Then he defends Jesus courageously amid severe persecution and declares, like, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then finally, he bows down in worship, Lord, I believe. But the Pharisees move in the opposite direction. You know, first, they are divided, like, this man isn't from God. And then they threaten to throw people out of the synagogue for believing him to be the Messiah, to be Christ. And then they blaspheme Jesus uh, by calling him a sinner. And finally, they throw the man out for following Jesus. You see, what becomes plain uh, is that what initially began as a, as a miracle of healing physical blindness is actually a picture of healing spiritual blindness. And we know that we're on the right track because Jesus explains his work to us in verse 39. For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. And you know, the Pharisees understood that Jesus was referring to them in the second half of this verse. Uh, because they asked him, like, are we also blind? And, and Jesus replies, well, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And let me try to unpack what Jesus is saying here. You see, Jesus points out that the Pharisees claim that to seeing is exactly what proves their guilt and condemns them. Well, let's see uh, in the context of our passage. You know, let's, let, let, me, let me just list a few of the things uh, that the Pharisees claim to see about Jesus. So remember in verse 16, that uh, this man is not from God. In verse 22, Jesus isn't the Messiah. In verse 24, this man is a sinner. And do you, do you see the irony here? Like, even though the Almighty Creator stood before them, performing signs and wonders. <laughs> they still persistently rejected him. Why? Because they thought they knew better. And yet, it is exactly you see, their rejection of him that proved they were blind. You see, this is the scary thing about, physical, about spiritual blindness in the Bible. Like, spiritual blindness is not just merely a conscious and active rejection of God. You know, the truly terrifying thing is that it is also an inability to recognize one's own blindness and rejection of God. We're talking about complete spiritual failure here. And so John helps us see that Jesus is the light of the world whose light accomplishes two things. First, that Jesus does what God alone can do, and that is to give spiritual sight and rescue And second, he hardens and he blinds the hard-hearted who reject him and are convinced that they see, but who are in reality blind. So this this is the big picture that John wants us to see, uh, the the main point, or or so we say, 
Uh, and now that we establish that, let's see what Jesus' work means for our lives. And to do that, we're going to look in turn at, at the blind man, and then at Jesus, and then at the Pharisees, and see the lessons that we can draw from there. So I've got three lessons from the blind man's conversion, and then one each from Jesus' work and the Pharisees' rejection of him. Let me just drink some water. So what can we learn from the blind man's conversion? Now, firstly, the blind man's experience should humble us and bring us to our knees in worship. Why? Because it shows us that God is decisive in our salvation, not us. You see, it's not a coincidence that Jesus chose to display his work in a man born blind. See, notice the emphasis, he wasn't made blind. Like multiple times in the passage, we are told he was born blind. And why? Well, because this reflects the default human condition. You see, all of us, all of us without exception, are like the blind men. You see, you know, we may not be born physically blind, but we are born spiritually blind. You know, Jesus tells Nicodemus earlier in chapter 3, that unless one is born again or born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, spiritually blind people cannot see, you know, cannot see, let alone enter the kingdom of God. You see, like the Pharisees, you know, we would never have acknowledged our need of him. You see, we wouldn't even have known that we stood condemned. I you know what? Like, we wouldn't even have cared. But in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, Paul writes, a God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, that's the decisive action. Like, that's the reason you and I believe. You see, change happened because God shone in our hearts. Because Jesus opened our eyes and enabled us to see. You see, we, yeah, you and I, we are far more indebted and dependent on His grace than we realize. This is, you know, some of us have like really dramatic testimonies of how we came to faith. Uh, but for many of us, you know, the journey is you know, a bit more gradual, maybe even seemingly uneventful, you know, in comparison. But don't, you know, don't ever think uh, you're less of a Christian because of that. Uh, you know, in, in God's economy, there is no such thing as an ordinary conversion story. See, it, it, it took nothing, you know, nothing short of a miracle for any of us to believe. Like blind people cannot and will not see Jesus as beautiful and as all sufficient. And so, friends, please treasure this in your heart. Like your conversion is a truly deep and awesome thing uh, that should lead you to worship and to boast you know, in the Lord and what He has done for you. you know, once we were blind, uh, but now we see. May this always be the praise that's found on our lips. But secondly, Oops, that's the first one, yes. Secondly, uh, when we realize that, you know, all of us have received undeserved mercy, like we will stop saying no for people. And w what do I mean? Well, uh, ever been on a beach or, 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 you know, an outreach mission, and then choosing who to approach uh, based on how friendly the other person looks. Uh, you know, do you avoid the people with tattoos or shy away from those who are smoking? Maybe it's the, it's the foreigner, uh, the one who's different, the one who's potentially awkward to approach. Maybe it's the person who just swears all the time <laughs> and you just really don't want to be around him. And I've, been, I've been guilty of this, <laughs> and I suspect, like, so have you. And you know, if, we, if we were to be honest, like, the reason we avoid such people is because we judge them, because uh, we think they are less likely to believe. Or maybe sometimes it's just, that we, it's just because we don't like them and we write them off. But yet, yet you know, in, in the Gospels, uh, you know, 
the people we tend to avoid are also the, often the ones that Jesus calls to himself. You know, we, we think of Zacchaeus, uh, the tax collector, the Samaritan woman at the well, the blind man in our story today. Like in, this, in all of this, like the decisive act always belonged to Jesus. You see, there isn't a single person on the earth who is so blind that the light of the world is unable to unblind. And so, so friends, I, I invite you tonight to consider who there might be in your life at the moment that you are saying no for. You know, who might there be that you are not maybe particularly fond of? Well, re remember that Jesus didn't say no to you. And so you don't say no for them. And finally, uh, what we see in a blind man's conversion is that Jesus' action is decisive not only in starting the work, but also in completing it. You see, despite how harshly like, the blind man was treated, despite how he was oppressed by the Pharisees, you know, despite being left to fend for himself, like, even by his own family, the blind man stuck with and persisted with Jesus. You know, we, we are a church that experiences uh, quite a bit of turnover every year. You know, every year we re receive and we send new students out. Every year, some of our youth leave for university elsewhere. And like, it's so easy, you know, and so it's really easy for us to worry about the dangers of new or young Christians falling away as they relocate elsewhere you know, or as they start to feel the heat. But what we see with the blind man, you know, is that once the work of God has begun in a person's heart, like God will bring it to completion. Once the work of God has begun in a, in a man's heart, God will bring it to completion. And so even though lockdown has disrupted so many of our ministries, now even though we are unable to physically follow up with people that have just started bearing fruit, now even when people who we really care for are going through extremely hard times. Like, in all of that, we can be confident of entrusting them into Jesus' care. Like, he will keep and he will protect them because that's who he is. And we'll see a bit more of this next week. And next, uh, yeah, I've got one lesson that we can learn from Jesus' work. But I think, you know, when, when you think of Jesus in this passage, I think that the surprising thing that pops up is that he appears to be absent from most of the action, you know, as though he simply just healed the man, left him there to fend for himself. But yet, you know, as we have established, like Jesus wasn't absent at all. No, you know, he was always in the background, opening the spiritual eyes of the man. And see, that's the, that's the point, friends. Like God's work, like God often doesn't work in a way that we can plainly or immediately quantify it's not often visible, but that doesn't mean he isn't. Like each of us, each of us are living testimonies that he is at work and that he has been at work. And so at this point, I just want to say you know, something quick to those of us with unbelieving friends and family you know, that we really love and we care about. Like, you know, those, those of us who are weary after years and years of unanswered prayer, I just want to be you know, as sensitive as possible as I say this, because I do not dare say that I know how you feel. But, you know, two weeks ago, George quoted uh, the example of a man, Luke Short, who came to faith 85 years after hearing a sermon. You see, 85 years. Now, I bet nobody thought God was working in his, in his heart, but he was. And the point is, we just never know what Jesus might be doing in someone's heart. Like, you, you know, I, I, can't, I can't promise you that your friend or your loved one will repent. But yet Jesus' work, because Jesus' work is decisive, like you really, really can have hope. You know, as fruitless as your efforts might seem, you know, as hard and as resistant to the gospel your loved ones might be, as little interest as they might show, right? There is real purpose in your unwavering prayers. See, there is real meaning in your constant, maybe even futile or, or feeble attempts of sharing your faith. So, so please take heart. 
right? Because there is real hope in your efforts. And I hope this encourages you, even, that, even in just a tiny bit. But finally, a lesson that we can learn uh, from the Pharisees' rejection. And on this note, we will end. So the Pharisees' unbelief calls us to action. The Pharisees' unbelief calls us to action. Let me read verse 41 for you again. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. You see, Jesus attributes the Pharisees' claim to see as the reason why their sin remains. You know, in, in John uh, chapter 3, verse 19, uh, Jesus says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And John Piper uh, helpfully summarizes it in this way. You see, we are blind because we don't want to see the light or be guided by the light or have to confess our works to be, da- to be works of darkness. And this blindness does not dis- diminish our guilt or remove our accountability. Like, it is part of our guilt. Now, yes, like Jesus is decisive in opening spiritual eyes, but yet it was also the blind man's responsibility to recognize the evidence and to respond. And respond he did, like, despite the persecution, despite the risks to himself, despite being completely alone. And at the same time, it was also the Pharisees' responsibility to see. They saw the evidence, but they refused to believe. And so in judgment, the light of the world further hardened their eyes and blinded their eyes. So again, like God's sovereignty acts in a way that doesn't negate our human responsibility. So then the question for you and I is this. Now, what, what will you do uh, with the evidence as you look at Jesus? You know, will you respond as the man did in faith, in worship and faith? Or will you reject him as the Pharisees did? Let, let me just read Jesus' invitation in verse 39 for us as we end. For judgment I came into the world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Friends, like Jesus offers us two ways to live, like two roads with two very different eternal outcomes. And so if I may just boldly appeal to you right now, like, please don't resist the light. Like, please lay hold of Jesus' offer. Like, he came, yes, he came, so that those who are blind may see. And like, he came to give you and me sight. Let's pray. Once I was blind, uh, but now I see. Father, thank you for uh, the wonder of our salvation. We're just so humbled uh, as we come to you this evening to know that even our coming to you, even our repentance was enabled by you. So thank you that you have shown in our hearts and thank you that you've enabled us to see your glory in the face of your Son. And Father, I pray that you will fill us with a deep sense of humility and joy as we reflect on these things together. And I pray that this truth will be a sweet comfort for those of us who are weary. And please, with your truth, I please with these truths have the effect of producing in, in us, in each of us, like a deeper love and appreciation for you. And would this really just drive us to to live lives of of service uh, for your glory and for your name's sake. Because we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in with us at Beeston Free Online. Uh, Next week, uh, well, before next week, uh, so we've got some songs that uh, we've been selected especially for to help us reflect on the things that we've looked at together. Uh, so do have a listen to them as, as, we, as you think through these things. But next week, yes, next week we'll be looking at John chapter 10.
And if you've got some time on your hands to spare this week, may I suggest that you have a read of uh, Ezekiel chapter 34 in advance. You see, John 10 has many allusions to Ezekiel, uh, so having a little background of it will be helpful. But as we close, uh, let me just read these words from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. Amen. I'll take care, everybody, and see you next week. Bye-bye.